a recording right now. Doug, please take it away. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the GIOS common infrastructure. So basically, GCI is a short name for the core capabilities that allow for the discovery and sharing of information in, within GIOS itself. So it's not all of GIOS, but rather uh, a set of components that are run to help. Um, it's like the glue that helps make everything fit together. Um, I'll go through each of the, the different elements or components within the GCI and show you a couple diagrams and some of the issues we're working through in terms of uh, general improvements to the GCI. <clears throat> so the first um, main component that people are aware of is the Geo Web Portal, more recently renamed GEOS Web Portal, which is a web interface to search and access GEOS. So this is where the majority of users come to perform a search and look at metadata. So these are descriptions of uh, contributed resources. And then click through the metadata to access it. Um, so it is the front end. It's the user interface. And it interacts with the third bullet directly, which is the discovery and access broker. <clears throat> um, the discovery and access broker is originally was a means to search remote catalogs in real time and then do some, uh, well, en enable the conversion of certain data sets or projections into other ones. That's the access part of it. It can actually access and process some remote data. But primarily you want to think of it as a gateway <clears throat> to uh, multiple catalogs that have been registered from agencies or professional organizations around the world. Uh, so there are like national SDI catalogs and imagery catalogs that are set up that have deep inventories as well as uh, typically collection level metadata. And so examples of these catalogs might be the WIS from the weather community, the Global Change Master Directory, or CIOS IDN, uh, the INSPIRE catalog, the Canadian and U.S. National Spatial Data Infrastructure catalogs, uh, each of which has thousands of data sets in it. They may have a, a specific topical or um, or geographic focus, but uh, collectively they represent the committed resources to GIOS. <clears throat> and the second bullet is the component and service registry, and that is the place that one would start to publish information. Uh, so this is basically the place that holds the pledges of GEO members and participating organizations to commit resources. It also enables the tagging of, um, of certain aspects relative to GEO that are unique, like GEOS Data Core. You can actually put that into the description. You can also affiliate it with the societal benefit area or multiple SBAs if you have them. Uh, declare the, um, the, the frequency of the data to say it's continuously operational or it's a historic data set, um, as well as a few other items. But basically it collects metadata that enables the DAB to uh, perform the search and access or the clearinghouse. <clears throat> so point four is the clearinghouse. And the clearinghouse is what well, was originally designed as a facility to harvest catalogs that don't change very often. So rather than having the DAB connect to dozens of catalogs, maybe a hundred catalogs around the world in real time and wait for the responses to come back, the clearinghouse was created as a means to harvest a number of those catalogs and keep them in a single cache so that it's one catalog instead of maybe 10 or 15 that the DAB would have to access. Uh, more recently, we recognized that the DAB has the capability to perform both harvest as well as direct or remote search. And so the clearinghouse functionality is going to be going away. Um, <clears throat> so. From an end user point of view, even a publisher point of view, you don't really need to understand the clearinghouse or discovery and access broker choices. Um, that's kind of part of the, the silent machinery behind the scenes. You would interact with the component and service registry where you register your resources. And then once approved, you would see them in the GeoWeb portal. <clears throat> The fifth bullet is the standards and interoperability registry. And this contains information on standards 
um, and interoperability arrangements, so ad hoc standards as well as official standards that are implemented or endorsed by GEO. So it's, it's like a taxonomy or a set of codes and definitions that come from the standards world, including things like OGC standards, ISO standards, as well as web standards that are relevant <coughs> for, uh, for data access. The best practices wiki is where uh, documentation on techniques, practices are encouraged to be placed. So if you had a calibration technique, or a, you know, CalVal technique that you wanted to share with the world or something similar to that, then it is a, a structured way to collect that information and point out to other resources or other places where that might be expanded. <clears throat> The user requirement registry is a fairly new, probably our newest component here, and it contains data-oriented user requirements. These user requirements are archetypical for specific categories of users. So let's say I'm a climate modeling scientist. What kinds of things do I need? <clears throat> um, and so these are intended to identify the demands on Earth observation data and then when connected to the catalogs that we have, identify both coverage of those interesting properties like precipitation data, as well as gaps. And so this could be used to help formulate collection campaigns for new Earth observation sensors, um, as well as identify multiple sources for some types of data. <clears throat> and finally, the semantic registry is kind of a silent uh, participant within GCI. It exists behind the Discovery and Access Broker and the GO, GIS Web Portal as a, a growing taxonomy or set of taxa which allow vocabularies to be searched and expanded. So if you go to the GIS Portal now and you were to start typing in the term, like precipitation, it would volunteer the rest of the word and similar words to it. So it's an auto-suggest function that is achieved by having a semantic registry or an ontology. So instead of playing 20 questions type, trying to type in words, it knows what words have already been indexed from the earth observations and critical observation values, and it'll start keying those in, uh, training you towards those words that it knows are already in the index. <clears throat> and so these interface externally with Earth Observation Inventory clients like Quick and Genesee. Um, they, these are massive tens of millions of uh, satellite images, for example, in, in these clients, as well as primarily the fledged catalogs of descriptive metadata and your own metadata that you might be contributing through the CSR as an individual metadata record. <clears throat> So the current architecture then, the, uh, the GIOS user at the top would be accessing the GeoWeb portal, and that's the public face, the front end. Um, but from a publisher's point of view, and I would assume many of the folks on this call would be interested in registering as well as accessing the resources. Uh, so they would be using the component and service registry to register items. That goes into, currently goes into the clearinghouse which is accessed by the Discovery and Access Broker and is would point back to the metadata that points to the actual catalogs of the distance. Um, and inside the metadata, you would have links to your software, your uh, web services, applications, community portals, data sets. All those things <clears throat> are pointed to from the metadata so that the client can, can know what to do. Now behind this, from an API point of view, there are also access points. Um, these are the interactions, and it's, it's a, another scary wiring diagram, but essentially if there is an orange uh, egg on the, on the diagram, there's supposed to be circles initially, but they got distended in this graphic, um, then there's an API on that. So if you wanted to perform a search from your mobile client of what's actually in the DAB right now, what, what the DAB knows about. So all those remote resources, then you can access it through either an open search or a CSW query. And so in the upper left quadrant there you'll see a searches arrow and the discovery and access broker. And there is a, that API is what's being used by the GEO web portal to query for all of the resources that are out there in the, 
uh, that have been pledged to GEO. So there are a number of API um, endpoints that you could use to directly access via software the resources that you see here. And then when you get a handle to a resource, so it's basically a URL inside the metadata, then you would go directly to the resource being described, the data set, the service, whatever the end provider was looking for. And so I'll, I'll, you know, there's a lot of inspection that can be done on this uh, slide, but I'll leave that for you uh, after the call. <clears throat> so we've got some usability issues as well as some, some path forwards. Right now we really can't document percentage of coverage within GIOS. You know, people say, well, how much of EO data in general um, are in GIOS? And we don't know, can we say 12% or 50% or 100%? We, we can't. And so we need to work with the providers to get a good sense of the comprehensive nature of GIOS and the GCI. Um, but, you know, as always, we need more resources to be committed, to be registered through CSR and connected through the DAB. <clears throat> in terms of registered service, we, we note that in most communities there are already catalogs, either the national communities or professional communities. Um, the biggest one is probably the CIOS, the IDN, the International Directory Network of Earth Observation Data. This is where all the space agencies and other Earth observation agencies put their metadata. So there's tens of thousands of first order data sets described there. But we harvest that. So in many professional circles, people would be contributing to the IDN already through their national venues. They don't have to register that resource again. And that's a, a good, um, good thing to know because chances are good if you're already in those circles, you've already done the work to get into GIOS. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of service quality, we are working on integrating a, a service status checker. It's a quality of service checker that would be run daily and provide an iconic view on the metadata when it comes back, kind of a health check to say if this is a web service. Um, I, was not, I was able to not just ping it, but I could actually invoke a service invocation like a get capabilities in OGC and get a result back and, and it returns a statistic every day. Um, a number of metric which is a function of it, it, its round trip search time, uh, an optimized round trip search time, plus the ability to invoke a series of operations on that, um, that service. So it knows, at least in the last 24 hours, if it's doing well. And there's a dashboard behind that for anyone who pledges those services. <clears throat> so this is something we plan to integrate this year. Um, we do have user interfaces on the prior diagram into many of our components. So some people could go and look at the clearinghouse or look at the CSR and see uh, inventories and, and results there. But if you go through the DAB and the GIOS web portal, you might see a different set. <clears throat> so there is an issue if you come in uh, from a user interface to see different things. And we need to be sure that all the inventories are searchable through the DAB and presented through the GIOS web portal. So we're, again, we're working on that workflow over the next six months to improve that performance. And just a general fact, uh, truth, search behaviors, a search must return what's expected and the ranking of results must be meaningful. So the, these are goals that again, the DAB is gonna be working towards making it work across multiple collections, which isn't easy because they may have different uh, contexts for the initial ranking and presentation of the results. <clears throat> and we've also promoted through prior AIPs the idea of linking helper applications into the solution, into the system here, so that if I come up with an interesting or perhaps unusual file format that's been returned to me in, in a URL, that I could be volunteered a slate of open source and commercial applications that would help me process that information. Let's say it's NetCDF or, or HDF or something like that that you might not have a desktop client for. This could allow you to download that or even use it in a web integrated. <clears throat> and these are some of the questions that we're answering or asking this year again through AIP as well as others. How do we license? And how, how is user management done? If we would like to have single sign-on across the, uh, 
the GCI, for example. So there may be some agreements between the components that would allow, that have to be, to allow single sign-on to take place. And how do we decide which semantic information is used? What vocabulary should we be using? And who does the integration of those? And there is already afoot an effort to promote community portals in a very standard way. Um, so can we expect that all the SBAs might have that to feature things within the GCI and show FASTA resources? And this, uh, the fifth bullet or fourth bullet is very specific to this AIP. How would mobile clients and enabler applications interact with the other GCI components? Um, so we want to, again, make official that lollipop diagram I had as figure two um, to understand where those endpoints are, the interfaces, so that you guys can do the right thing with mobile clients if you're going to be accessing them. <clears throat> and how would content quality information be tracked and made available? There was a presentation at, web, uh, or at the uh, Work Plan Symposium um, about the geo label. So we will be pursuing that as an outcome of the geo VQA effort to see how that could be integrated back into the presentation of results. And that is the overview of the GCI. So, do you have questions now? Uh, thank you, Doug. And as we're recording the session, I would prefer that we ask the questions at the end of the session. Um, okay. No so, I would like to pass it on to Steve. Who will talk about the registry? Steve, are you ready to be the presenter? Uh, I am. Then, if you could start sharing your screen. <clears throat> can you see it? We can see your screen. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to um, go through a few slides um, relatively quickly about the registries and then I'm going to do a, hopefully a live demo that doesn't crash. <laughs> um, so uh, Doug showed you this uh, diagram basically uh, before. Uh, what I wanted to do was to say that within this diagram of course there are the registries. Um, the only reason the components and services registry is singled out is because it's sort of the main registry that interacts with the rest of the GCI on a regular basis. Um, the other registries, as has been mentioned, is the standards and operability regi registry, the best practices wiki, which isn't really a registry yet, but it, it is hoping to be. Um, the semantic registry, which is not actually available to the public, it just sits, as Doug said, behind the other components and the user requirements which is currently undeployed in the GCI although there is a working version um, and the user requirements registry is slated to evolve into what um, is now being called a, a knowledge base uh, for uh, GEOS. So I'm not sure what the time frame on that is but um, it, it, as of right now the user requirements registry is not in the not operational in the GCI. Um, so the operational components are the standards and operability registry. We refer to that as the SIR. Um, it's managed by the SIF, the Standards and Interoperability Forum, which I chair, um, and also IEEE uh, uh, hosts it and maintains it. The Components and Services Registry is managed by GMU um, and uh, USGS. Best Practices Wiki, again, is the SIF and IEEE. Um, so the registry interaction, uh, you'll see here, the main interaction is really, really between the Components and Services Registry and the um, SIR, the Standards and Interoperability Registry. And you can see here how that interaction takes place. Somebody who registers a standard or a special interoperability arrangement, um, those get harvested by the Components and Services Registry. I'll show you that in, in the demo in a moment. Um, and it's also possible for the Components and Services Registry to um, nominate um, new standards or special arrangements that have yet to be registered into the standards and interoperability registry directly. Uh, both the CSR and the SIR have um, 
programmatic or API type access. So um, that's, that's possible if you wish to do it from a community, for instance. The standards taxonomy that the standards interoperability registry uses has these different categories in the taxonomy. Um, you'll see that in the entry form for registering a standard, um, whether you register it at the SIR or the CSR. And so far, as of, as of today, uh, this is the breakdown of the entries in the, uh, in the SIR with regards to their uh, cat taxonomy categories. So you, you can take a look at that later. I'm sure the slides are going to be published somewhere. And uh, just a, a shameless plug here, that if anybody who's new to the uh, GS process or the GS uh, initiative, if you'd like to get involved with the standards and interoperability forum, just send me an email. We l love to get new people to participate. Um, okay, so that's it for the slides. Let me uh, go and give you a slight, you know, sh short live demonstration. So the page you're looking at right now is the actual standards and interoperability registry user interface. And when you go to the site, which is shown up here, this is the page you see first. Now, forget about the SIF, the SIF stuff, but up here, you can either search the registry, you can propose a new entry, or you can get help. Um, so to search, you don't need to log in, but you do have to register and log in if you want to propose a new entry. And you would do that, well, I'm already logged in, but if you were logged out, you would see a registration button down at the bottom. So for instance, in order to search, you click search. now. This is just a, 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 the initial page is just sort of a search on an empty string. I can type something in here, for instance, say OGC, and do a basic search. Now, the basic search um, searches for OGC in, in all the text, text fields. And so it'll come back. So there's 62 entries involving the phrase OGC somewhere. And you can see that there's different standards here uh, that are OGC based. But if you want to do a more targeted search, you can hit advanced search. And then you can search on various fields specifically. Um, so for instance, suppose you just wanted to see, well, what, what has been registered for streaming protocols? So I simply pick the streaming protocols and do a search. And I see that there's just 10. And you can look at them. Okay, so, um, so you can do a basic search or a more advanced search. Um, you can always edit your own record. You can only edit your own record. You can't edit anybody else's records. And by that, I mean it, when you propose a new entry. So I'll go to propose new entry. So this is the entry form. It's not too bad. Uh, you pick whether it's a standard or a special arrangement. Um, as Doug mentioned, the special arrangements are sort of the standards wannabes. There may be they may be community standards, but haven't been recognized by a standards organization yet. Um, you provide a name for the standard, a version, title, description, so on and so forth. You pick a taxonomy category for primary. We also support secondary taxonomy categories. So you can pick one of the primary ones as a secondary. Um, and usually provide a URL to where the standard can be found. Um, and um, you provide contact information. And so um, you can submit this or you can save as a draft if you're not ready to do it, if you have to look up information. Ultimately, you would submit it. And then, then it'll show up in the search that we just looked at. So this is a way of coming to the uh, GCI, in particular the standards registry, and registering a new standard that is presumably going to be used within GIOS. Um, a data provider would typically do this um, to specify what standards are being used with the data that they provide or the services that they are providing. Um, now, you can also register at the SIR through registering a service or a data set through the CSR. So this is the Components and Services Registry main entry screen. And if you've registered, you can do resource registration. But first, I want to show um, if, I, if you do a search um, here, and I'll, I'll just type in water since I think David's on the line, <laughs> David Arctor. <so. laughs> um, and I do a search. Now, this will bring back everything that's been registered 
in the CSR that has water associated with it. So I'll just pick New Zealand, look at its details. So if you look at, you'll see here that there are standards already associated with this, um, with, with this regist registration record. So there is a WFS service associated with it. WaterML is associated with it as a standard being used and GML. Okay, now those were chosen from when, when the person registered. So let me go back and do a registration. Not a full registration, but I'll just show you what I mean. So let's say I'm registering a data. This is the CSR registration. So let's suppose I'm registering a data set. I'm just going to type in some nonsense uh, URL. Uh, I'll say I'm not a GEO member. Uh, okay, next. So this is kind of the stuff that Doug was talking about a little bit. Uh, some of the things you specify when you register. I'll just say, uh, well, I guess I should say water. It doesn't really matter. You can pick more than one. Continuously operational. I'll say GS Data Core, which says that you have to actually say that you, this is the definition of GS Data Core. I won't go into it now, but you read it, make sure that's what you want. Say, okay. Um, you can provide spatial constraints and temporal constraints. They're optional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, Steve, we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Is this the, uh, the machine crashes? flaked out a bit. <laughs> okay, so now the next picture. So yeah, so I was afraid it was crashing. So okay, so on this this is the last page, and it has to do with picking standards. And the main so here is the um, is sort of the uh, taxonomy vocabulary for Earth observation. So I can pick out say SST as a parameter that I'm interested in. Now here are the standards and special arrangements. The ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that are of primary importance. Uh, I have to pick one from there for this data set. Okay, so if I don't, it'll give me an error. But I can also pick from the other ones if I want to. So let's say I take uh, data access and I'll say, uh, okay, this is, uh, I don't know, let's just say, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I'll just say that. Okay, so now I've associated that standard with what I'm registering in the CSR. Now this list that I'm picking from comes from the standards registry. So this is a live interoperability mechanism between the SIR and the CSR and it updates you know every time somebody starts using the CSR it goes and gets an update of this list. So um, if you registered something in the standards registry you know, and then went to try to use it, um, almost immediately you should be able to see it in this list. Okay, so this list is just reflecting what's been entered at the standards registry. But suppose that you were registering at the CSR and you looked under this list, suppose, suppose you were registering data access like we did. So let me, let me take this out and I look under data access and I say, hey, there's nothing in here that satisfies what I have. I need to register a new standard because it's not in the list. So you highlight the category and then you can click on register standard or special arrangement. If you do that, you'll get a form. Um, assuming my machine works properly. Three minutes. Steve. Looks like it's taking a second. Ultimately, the form you get will look just like um, not visually just like, but in terms of fields, will look just like the um, the form that you would have filled in at the standards registry. So I'm not sure why this is taking as much time as it is. <clears throat> just bear with me a second. Here we go. So here's the, these are the fields. You'll notice, sorry Bart. Two minutes please, thank you. So you'll notice that the fields here are just like the ones that uh, were shown at the standards registry. And so you fill them all in. And once you fill them in, hello, can you hear me? Yes, Steve, go on, continue. OK, sorry. Uh, uh, so once you fill them in, you would just submit this. You say register. 
I won't click it. And then the information here will be sent immediately from the components and services registry to the standards registry. And then it will then be registered at the standards registry. So if I went back and did a search on the standards registry, I would find this new standard there. So, so you, can, you can operate back and forth between the SIR and the CSR, both programmatically and even through the user interface. So that's the standards registry and it's linked to the components and services registry. And then the last, the last thing I want to talk about very quickly is the best practices wiki. As I said, this is not a real registry at this point. It really is a wiki. Uh, we have plans to make it a registry, but um, probably not in the very, very near future. Um, this best practices wiki, as Doug mentioned, um, is a place to store best practices, guidelines, you know, uh, community papers that explain the best way to do things, uh, all that stuff. But we also use it as an anchor for the tutorials that get developed uh, for GIOS. And many of these tutorials have been developed in the AIP process, and I would encourage anybody currently involved in AIP 7 to think about developing tutorials. You just need to get in touch with me and I can set up an area here for you. So in the best practices week we have tutorials like provider tutorials. These have been developed before and, and we also have uh, user tutorials. Um, so let me go to one that's been developed, the SOS tutorial. And you'll see that um, when it comes up, so there's a there's a list of pages. It's developed. These are developed in pages, but you can print them out with all the pages sort of concatenated, so you have like a manual. But uh, there's a table of contents, and I'll just show you that quickly because that'll, that'll explain the other pages. I won't go through them. But there's an introduction um, for tutorials in general. It should be the same throughout all tutorials. There is a tutorial introduction just for the specific tutorial. There's a discussion of use cases. Um, there is a chapter on actually realizing those use cases and then depending on who writes a the tutorial there could be an appendix and a glossary and things like that. But the SIF manages the tutorial process and we try to keep kind of the look and feel or the template of the tutorials um, between them as common and consistent as possible. And so the, the tutorial area of the best practices wiki is private while it's being worked on, so nobody can see it except those who have been registered to access those pages. And then when we, you know, when, it, when it's determined that it's ready to go public, we just make it public. We just flip a flag, essentially, and then that becomes public. Um, and so that's all I need to, that's all I have to say, Bart, about the registries. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation. So we've had a general introduction by Doug on the GCI, we've dive dived into the registries. Another important component of the GCI is the DAB. So, Mattia, if you're ready to be a presenter, then Mattia will talk us about the data and access program. Yes, I am. Okay, make a presenter right now. If you could start sharing your screen, you should be all set. Okay. Okay, I can see your screen. Go ahead. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. fine. Okay, uh, good afternoon, and uh, I'm Matthias Santoro from CNR. I'm going to to present some slides about how to access the Geo Discovery and Access Broker, which is one of the components uh, in the GCI, which allows uh, discovering and accessing Geo's contributed data. So, at a very, uh, very simplified scheme of what uh, the GCI aims to do, uh, it tries to connect two, let's say, layers, two players in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this environment of geos. We have on one side the science and the society, so the users, essentially, and on the other side we have the data and the information capacities contributing uh, to geos. So a very, very simplified uh, schema of the GCI that you have already seen in detail in previous uh, uh, presentations is that we have the GEOS web portal, the GeoDAB, the registry. And in the GeoDAB here, of course, there are other components uh, which are not only this, but as I said, this is a very oversimplified schema useful for this presentation. So the, the 
uh, objective of the GCI is interconnecting these two layers, users and providers. Okay, the GeoDub is the component which is in charge of uh, connecting all the different systems and capacities contributing to GEOS, to the GCI. And uh, it is uh, connected directly to the GEOS web portal that uh, in this way is able to search, discover and access data from the different distributed and heterogeneous systems contributing to GEOS. But uh, it is also, the GeoDub is also conceived and designed to uh, uh, be able uh, to be accessed by uh, other client applications, by other client, by other users essentially, not only through the Geo portal which is the main entry point, but uh, through a set of uh, uh, APIs uh, that I'm going to describe in, in the following slides, uh, it is possible for other client applications to access uh, the uh, discovery and access broker. So how is it possible to access uh, the GeoDub? Uh, the objective of uh, this component is to connect many client applications, user communities, user types, to many data providers, many community resources uh, coming with different services, different standards, different protocols, and so on and so forth. So the GeoDub publishes a set of well-known international standard, de facto standard interfaces, service interfaces, and also a set of uh, client-side libraries, APIs, for being accessed. And now I'm going uh, to detail these two types of uh, access. As far as uh, service interfaces, the GeoDub publishes a number of these, uh, the OGC, CSW, and uh, with uh, several applications, profiles, uh, core, ISO, etc., etc. It publishes the open search uh, interface, of course, with the geo and time extension plus the semantic extension to allow users uh, run semantics enabled queries. Then it publishes other interfaces such as OAI, OAI PMH and uh, other for this. So far, we have uh, discovery interfaces. Then we have, as far as access and transformation interfaces, web processing service, and uh, many of, of the main OGC access services, so web coverage, web feature, web map, and so on. So the libraries, the client-side libraries, why? Because uh, the interfaces we have seen in this slide are let's say, uh, service interfaces. So in order to access this component, uh, the client application developers need to have uh, a quite good knowledge of these protocols of, uh, the, uh, of the metadata models which are supported by these protocols and a lot of uh, very technical details, uh, which is not always the case. So we have developed a set of client-side uh, JavaScript libraries. Uh, why JavaScript? Because uh, from this uh, uh, survey that was conducted, uh, the main APIs used in the web context are REST APIs, SOAP APIs, and these two types are covered by the the interfaces uh, that I have shown in my previous slide. And then we have uh, that uh, JavaScript APIs, the JavaScript language is uh, the most used as far as client-side APIs. Uh, so what the, do I mean by client-side? I mean that uh, these APIs can be downloaded and used inside uh, the development of uh, the client application for connecting to the GeoDub. 
So the objectives of uh, this API are to support and facilitate the creation of uh, web clients exploiting the functionalities which are provided by the Discovery and Access Broker and to provide also an environment uh, to learn by examples. So to learn using these APIs and integrating these APIs into client applications by example. Uh, the criteria that uh, drove the development and the design of uh, these APIs uh, were mainly to expose the different functionalities of the Discover and Access Broker in a very, very simple way, hiding all the complexity uh, which comes when you when you use uh, uh, s web service protocols. Okay, uh, so easy programming for the most common operations and uh, integration with uh, you know uh, and possibility to use uh, the full interfaces if uh, it is needed and uh, the full options which are available. So at the very high level the conceptual model of these APIs you have a discover and access broker object that uh, can discover and uh, semantically you know uh, expand uh, this gives you a result set which is made of uh, nodes of GI nodes that can uh, either be complex nodes so can be further expanded or uh, let's say uh, leaf nodes uh, that you can preview access and uh, transport then you have a uh, couple of objects uh, which are utility objects uh, for paging uh, uh, results so that uh, uh, you will have you will not have to download the entire result set in, in, in one query only this is uh, the very uh, high level and very simple conceptual model we have developed for these APIs to allow the uh, support to support the web development of client applications to support uh, the development of community portals applications apps and uh, of course uh, there are some specific characteristics of uh, these libraries uh, in particular these are based on an asynchronous model uh, which is essentially inherited from uh, the JavaScript language and uh, it, uh, it is able to handle some tasks uh, which might uh, consume more time such as the live distribution of the queries then uh, we have facilitated dedicated uh, operations for facilitating the mashup and we have a quite good integration uh, with the GA query framework for uh, for the uh, easy development of widgets so you ha you can download and view both the APIs and the documentation online uh, this is uh, the home page where you have uh, the typical documentation of the JavaScript APIs and you can download the libraries and uh, you have a set of examples that uh, you can test by yourselves and uh, replicate on your client applications so that uh, it is easier uh, to to develop using these libraries and uh, these are the contacts for uh, this specific uh, tool we have a mailing list and then we have some uh, person contacts here uh, that I'm going I'm not going to read and uh, and that's it for uh, on my side here all right thank you very much uh, Mattia very instructive um, we'll now move to the last speaker for today's session, and that is Guido, who will take us through using the GeoPortal. Guido, are you ready to be presented? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we'll have it okay. right now. Yes, uh, sharing I will show my screen in a second. Okay, super. Thank you. Can you see it? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. So, hi, um, my name is Guido Colangeli. I'm working at the European Space Agency, supporting ESA in the, some geo-related geo activities. So we'll do some, uh, just a live demo from <clears throat> a staging server uh, where the geos portal is, but you can fully, uh, you can use the, um, the, the, the official geos portal at www.geoportal.org and that is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, we'll do just a demo from here because there are some new functionalities that have not been yet plugged into the uh, operational one. So that's the main, um, the main page, uh, the, the splash screen of the Geos portal. Um, on the left most, uh, um, th there is a discovery map and search boxes on the first and uh, foremost uh, spot. There are some uh, video tutorial corner that you can access, uh, where you can access some uh, some links uh, to the YouTube channels of the Geos portal, and you can then uh, just click on a couple of tutorials that we already plugged in. Um, there is some description of the portal, uh, a link to the uh, registry. Uh, to the commons, uh, to the service registry that uh, just mentioned Steve before. Um, you have a link to send your feedback uh, uh, to the to the Geos portal in form of an announcement or, or report a problem or just give a, give opinions on the on the portal. Then on, on this section of the home page, there are some very popular search uh, that uh, uh, that. Uh, that, that you can just click on and you are just a couple of weeks of, away from data. So basically it's a, just a, it's a plugged in search. And then some news, uh, news from the Earth observations. But particularly I would like to just to show you uh, this uh, real-time um, uh, feed, uh, RSS feed, that are, uh, are automatically populating uh, the 2D map and uh, for example you can browse through here and uh, maybe click on one of them to see that there's are some uh, for example in this case is just floods in afghanistan and if you if you click on the on the news itself on the feed itself you are uh, uh, brought to the international chart and space and major disaster and with a description of the week of the event this is a real time uh, populated chart uh, and uh, oh there is some floods in serbia that is quite new and i hope that uh, we can found uh, in the in the um, in here Yes, uh, here it. <laughs> in fact, there is a uh, very new um, here. Yes, that's the flood in Serbia. Uh, so there's a new entry uh, from from the international charter. Um, this is just an example of how we can feed the the map with real time things. And I was just we were just thinking to use that uh, uh, we would like to propose it as a, uh, also as a feed from the community portals it might be a good good place to to show uh, to show some uh, particular interest data from from community portals uh, in here in the home page and that's the very last thing that we are uh, looking at the uh, from from the home page, we are just missing a section uh, with the community portals. That still there are some some discussion and uh, round uh, round discussions uh, about how we can display uh, the, this wealth of uh, data, and but uh, but also uh, wealth of uh, um, systems and browsers browsing systems from the community portal. So that's more or less from from just uh, the, uh, uh, an overview of the home page. But why we should have a look maybe uh, to 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 the data or just to some search by using first of all this popular search. For example, we are we can maybe uh, click on the land cover um, uh, popular search 
what he's doing right now is working just searching for the keyword Lankov and an open search interface uh, is fired through the geo uh, discovery and access broker and we are waiting for results from the discovery and access broker so we have the results here um, in, in this section um, this uh, the results are organized by say we have an item for it for each result retrieved we have a total number of results each result has a title and a short description and also um, we can access each uh, and uh, uh, result um, and accessing the um, the results by clicking on the title or just on the click to read more to read more so we uh, we can see some more detail on the data itself so if there is any preview it should be there uh, the organization the title the description basically the, the keywords that are describing this uh, the, the metadata um, and some geographical information if uh, uh, if the the data provider use that uh, visualization uh, display of the of the a bounding box uh, related to the to the metadata eventually some and possibly some temporal extent and uh, some distribution information so basically this is the metadata page that you can access by uh, by clicking on the title on this click to read more then for each result item there are some icons here that are uh, showing you that some you can handle this item by uh, looking at something basically you have here an icon chain saying that this data provider the provider that puts this item uh, available to the geos uh, um, catalog to be uh, to be browsed through um, uh, just uh, uh, set a list of metadata hyperlinks that you can access through or a list of images this uh, this uh, icon is just uh, a, a way to say that we are we we have a preview service that we can ask access and this other icon is uh, uh, the, the icon that let you download this uh, data in the format that the data this data provider is uh, is giving to us another thing that you can uh, maybe ha um, uh, see um, when you browse through the results you see that there is a bounding box on the 2d map that is just showing the bounding box that is related to the metadata itself so why not for example this is this the, the east hemisphere of the uh, geotiff so it should be a land cover because we just requested for a land cover so why not uh, click on this map uh, icon and see what kind of preview this uh, user, this data provider, is giving to us. So after a while, we should uh, <clears throat> see uh, uh, a preview here, a little preview in here that we can directly download onto the 2D map like that. Um, there is a, a, a layer menu that you can uh, use to to see uh, and to play with the layers with the layers with the layers that we can see um, that's uh, uh, we just did uh, some popular search we are going now just to see um, um, see through other uh, so, so, some other search criteria that you can fire uh, via the geos portal uh, for example why we should go for a particular theme so those so these are the societal benefit areas GOC is, in, uh, is, uh, is pushing. Um, so why not using again some water? Uh, we would like to see so what kind of results we can have for water, maybe with a specific keyword. For example, we can search for, I just type uh, the first two, war, two letters of the and you see that there are some essential variables that have been already plugged in and uh, help the user to find out uh, what is really uh, would like to, uh, to, to, to see. So we can then uh, fire the search. So to summarize, we are looking for a water SBA and uh, hydrology for, for the keyword hydrology. So we should then uh, see 
that there are a number of results, around a thousand results from the wealth of data, more than seven millions and more um, um, hits that we have from the, uh, from the in the catalog. The, in the big, big, big catalog uh, accessed uh, and harvested by the GeoDub. So we have here a number of, resul of results that are uh, uh, belonging to the water SPA and the contains uh, a keyword hydrology. So that's more or less what um, uh, this strongly depends obviously on the metadata that the data provider is, is, uh, is uh, pushing into the, uh, into the, the the catalog. So why not choosing this water level conditions? Mm, looks promising, it's just uh, uh, belonging to the boundary boxes on Canada and there should be some near real-time water level condition at uh, river and lake gouging. So it should be some in situ data um, coming from this organization that we can uh, look at later later when clicking on the read more or just on the title to see which which organization is putting this data available to all of us. So that, that's a preview that is just uh, some points that uh, from the preview are really, really uh, not so uh, uh, intellig intelligible. So in here we have um, sort of, uh, yes, the, this uh, those are the just real-time in situ gouging stations from Canada with their with their level. So presumably there are some blue points that are very uh, the, the, the the water level is 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 good. The green is okay. The white maybe there's no no measure, but we can have the uh, look at the description of the, the water level, see the preview now that is available and is also displayed into the metadata, and so from the description of that, uh, we can uh, see what, what this data provider just put uh, at our, at our um, availability. One more thing to see, maybe um, we'll make another, another search looking for another theme, maybe the energy, the energy one, so we would like just to see the energy maybe with a, a specific area, uh, so West Africa. And so we specify like that the bounding box where the search should be directed through. Again, the open search interface between the GIS portal and the GEO Discovery and Access Broker is in place and we have results back, a number of results, uh, not, not so many because we just restricted the, um, we just drive the query just on a specific area, the West, West Africa, so why not Picking this, uh, um, so we have should be energy generator. So we'll make a, a map here and see uh, what is uh, going to be what we are going to have um, on this location. So well, might be uh, looking at the icons. Uh, it seems that this data provider is giving us the uh, power plants location by uh, category, say, so these are windmills, uh, biomass, uh, uh, petrol, uh, petrol, um, 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 petrol, uh, um, I think so. Um, that's, that's another, another, another search that we can fire. Maybe we should also have a look to the some uh, satellite data. So still these are, we, we had a look to in situ data, some other um, um, compiled data. Maybe we can have a look to uh, some other, um, we are looking for surface air temperature maybe, surface air temperature. And uh, also, uh, we would like to pick. We are expert user. We are this. Uh, we are uh, scientists or researcher. So we we are ver we knew very well what kind of uh, catalog we would like to ask for. So those those are the are not the, the all the catalogs that uh, are going to be uh, searched uh, at runtime from the GeoDub. So. We are just uh, focusing on the uh, quick catalog, this CEOs uh, 
uh, we just integrated the uh, uh, catalog and so we are firing this search surface area temperature just on a specific catalog and see um, another kind of data that we can <coughs> browse through um, after the query um, so this is uh, Yes, so we have now a number of results that are coming from uh, this uh, from this query and from this particular catalog. You see that we have another icon here, and also we have a toggle here. This means that this uh, this is in fact a, a collection, meaning that we have inside this collection very many data uh, that. Uh, that are belonging to this uh, this search surface air temperature, but we really don't know what kind of uh, there is a world of data that is but just by clicking on here um, and searching the granules we can access at this very time at this very moment a query is fired to this collection uh, to see and to grab all the uh, granules that are coming from uh, uh, from this collection from the quick uh, catalog. So you see that uh, in this case uh, it's an HDF uh, um, uh, kind of file, and so we uh, we can uh, browse through it. Oops, we lost uh, maybe. Sorry, we lost the uh, the query. Uh, maybe we should have a look for another uh, Landsat, maybe. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Guido, we can hear you. Two minutes, thank you. Hello? Yeah, Guido, you, we read you. Oh, Go ahead. So, sorry, minutes, because I, I heard some... Okay, so, okay, two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. So we would like now to, sh uh, to see some Landsat things um, on and specifying again uh, specifying uh, the quick catalog. Uh, whoops. So we deselect all. Everything is selected by default. So if you specify something, uh, will be uh, just uh, all, just that catalog. Just just that catalog will be uh, will be uh, a query. So we are now searching for Landsat things. Uh, some Landsat data from this particular catalog, and uh, so we should have something here back. Yes, we have um, a little bit more than 80 results, uh, so apparently there are some calibration validation sites that probably are using Landsat site to calibrate their, their things, but uh, maybe at page two we can see something <laughs> more relevant and yes we have uh, some Landsat hate here and, uh, so, uh, and so this is a collection again because there is this icon and also you can search uh, here you can search uh, a particular a, part a, a granule from here and so uh, by clicking on the collection we have the granules here and you see by that the date is quite is uh, just just today. Yes, finished. Uh, is today. So by clicking on uh, on uh, this uh, entity, we we see the preview of this uh, again of this uh, uh, results uh, where uh, the the bounding box and also access information where you can directly uh, uh, grab the product. In this case, we can. The, the, they are coming from USGS. Um, you have to log in for the time being. We have we haven't a single sign on in place, but you know the, since AP3 that we we can um, uh, we should uh, implement the single sign on. So for the time being, you, you see that we can now download accessing it to, the, the, with a with a username that I gave. Uh, we can download. And access directly the data. So more or less, that, that's the end of uh, of uh, the end of this live demo. Thank you, Bart. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Guido, for for the presentation. I'll make myself presenter again. Show my screen. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending this session. Uh, I think we're we'll, we're a little bit late, but I would like to open the floor for a couple of questions.
uh, before we close it. So uh, if you unmute yourself, then uh, so, please ask your question. Uh, Bart? Yeah, uh, um, go ahead. Okay, so so I guess I'm wondering about um, when, when these uh, latest developments would be made available. So the the, the geoportal development that we've just been seeing and, and the harvest cycle time on the uh, DAB to mm -hmm. CSR. Okay, maybe that's a question for uh, for Mattia. Is Mattia still with us? Let me check. Yep, Mattia is still here. Yeah, sorry, I was I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Go ahead. Yeah, what we have just seen uh, in the demonstration of Guido is actually accessing the present DAB. So uh, Guido, I think, has just shown uh, the current version of the development of GeoSport portal in which we are, you know, collaborating with the G GWP team to to make all of this more stable and more uh, reliable as far as data data access as well so as far as the job uh, what you have just seen is already in place and uh, of course we're going to release uh, some new version uh, together with the new geo web portal uh, with uh, the updates I cannot give you any specific uh, date for the new release we have the last one was before the World Plan Symposium, and uh, I don't know. I, I, I it's not me to take <laughs> these kind of decisions, but uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know when oh, the next development. Okay, yeah. My other question was about the harvest cycle. Oh, uh, the harvest the... cycle. Okay. Yes. Well, you, you, you. This is not really mm, something that uh, that I can. Um, uh, uh, so you mean when uh, the next harvest cycle of the uh, CSR, the clearinghouse and this kind of things. Yeah. Uh, at the moment the clearinghouse is harvested once a month so it will be by the end of this month. End of the month. Yeah, end of the month. Is that, is that considered adequate? Uh, can't that be tuned by um, catalog? Because some catalogs are quite small and others are quite large. Yes, it is. It is uh, the schedule is uh, is uh, different for every catalog, and uh, well, uh, it's not me to to decide the the schedule. This is probably some something that uh, should be discussed uh, uh, at a governance meeting. It is really about governance. It's not technical. Of course, uh, it has a cost. The the we harvest. And because you have to update indexes, you have uh, you know to do several things. It has uh, it has for sure a cost, and uh, so far it was uh, it was good, and uh, so probably Stefano is uh, is the best person to to ask for uh, new schedules. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Mattia, for answering that. Uh, let's take one more question uh, before. Uh, before we close the session. No, we're overrunning by by a quarter of an hour. I do apologize for that. Yes, Bart, this is Ken McDonald. I have a quick question for uh, Guido or Mattia, I guess, and that is the interface, the current interface between the GeoWeb portal and the DAB. Is that using open search or the a APIs or which? Um, uh, sorry, Ken. S say again. Uh, it's the, it's an open search interface, but I um, um, I don't think I quite catched uh, your your question. The yeah, interface no, no, it was between the portal and uh, the DAB. Yeah. Wh which yes. are you using? Open search interface exposed by the DAB. Exposed by the DAB. Thank yeah. you. Okay. No all right. Thank Can you. Can we ask another question? Oh, okay, because it's you, Pat. The last, very last one then. <laughs> Thank you, Bart. Yes, it's Pat Capolia. I want to follow up with uh, if if I were to use that open search interface to the DAB programmatically to search for let's say Landsat Landsat eight data in a specific area, aren't we kind of Stuck because the single sign-on is not implemented, security is not there. 
at the moment, at the moment, uh, yes, we are in the plans are to have this in place uh, by the next plenary. So, at the moment, uh, yeah. You the are, next plenary in November. Uh, yeah, that is let's say our our deadline for this. Yeah. Right. So that means uh, we couldn't we couldn't use it until after November. You couldn't use what, Pat? Yeah. What, what exactly do you mean? Well, we couldn't use that. Well, we couldn't use the interface until after November. You we, cannot use the single sign-on, uh, yes, through the DAB. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the, the point is yeah, that so at the moment, yeah, yeah, it is an issue. It is an issue, yeah. and that's why we are going to implement this, uh, <laughs> of oh. course. Yeah, we, well, we have it as part of AIP you. as well. So. And, and Pat, do you specifically mean to access protected resources that the DAB well, points to? Well, accessing USGS, yeah. Okay. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're working on it in uh, in AIP, and I know the the folks at the the DAB are working on it as well. So, all right. So, all right. so yeah. I've got I've got one last real quick question. <laughs> what is the point of support that we should be directing people to who want to register resources? Oh, this, this is Steve. Well, um, uh, if you uh, oh, go ahead, Matthias. No, no, sorry, Steve. Just uh, no, no. I think uh, I don't know. I think the registration process is now being updated, but at the moment uh, we have these two ways. You know, one is through the CSR, and one is to be directly brokered uh, through the the DAP. So it really depends on the type of uh, you know system that uh, uh, that is going to be uh, to be added and contributed uh, to Geos. Okay. All right. Thank you all to uh, to close it here uh, for for time constraints. So I do want to thank everyone for attending the session. Um, please send your feedback and questions. I. Uh, to myself or, or to the group. I would like to thank my uh, speakers for today, Doug, Steve, Mattia, and, uh, and Guido. I will post uh, the slides. I will post uh, the presentation on this URL that I'll highlight uh, here. I will send that as, uh, to AIP Plenary as well so that you can just click on the link and then you will uh, be able to see the recording again. If you would like to send uh, feedback, you can use my email address, uh, Bart Delafauer. At, uh, at the OGC. So with that, I would like uh, to close the session. And again, thanks everyone for attending. And uh, if, uh, if you think you can participate in AIP, then please let us know. Always looking for, uh, for more contributions. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.